Hi everyone, this is Chapter 5, Adlerian Therapy, Part 2. Alright, now let's talk about birth order and sibling relationships. This part tends to be quite fun with the class, uh, and I know that we had discussed this a little bit before, but let's go into it um, in this lecture. There are five psychological positions, and the first one is the oldest, the second one is the second of only two, the third is the middle, the fourth is the youngest, and the fifth is an only child. So remember, when it comes to birth order, not a deterministic concept, which means that this is not it, right? Obviously, everyone's going to have a unique uh, uh, way of growing up, uh, but it does increase an individual's probability of having certain sets of experiences or how they might see the world because of it. Um, and then the other thing that we want to make sure is birth order is not, it, I'm sorry, birth order is less important than the individual's interpretation of his or her or their place in the family, right? So remember, is it's really about how they feel about it, not the objective reality that we we're talking about, which is like you're the oldest child, but also the subjective reality of all of that as well, which is how they felt being the oldest child, let's say, okay? All right, first is the oldest child receives a good deal of attention when he, she, they uh, are the only child, somewhat spoiled and the center of attention, and dependable and hardworking and strives to keep ahead. However, once a younger child is born, the oldest is ousted from that favorite spot. No longer unique or special, may believe that the new member will steal all the love from the parents, uh, you know, from the parents. And then reaction is being a perfect child, so this is how you cope with it, right? bossing your younger siblings around, and then show le uh, high levels of achievement so that you feel like you still have some standing with your family members. Are you an only oldest child? Is it similar to how uh, you felt? All right, the second one is called the second child uh, of only two children. From that time of birth, shares attention with the older sibling, behaves like it is a race and active at all times, Competitiveness affects life later on, finds out weak spots in older siblings, and then excels at those parts to win the love of the parents, and then seen as the opposite of the firstborn. So were you the second child, and do you agree with this? The third one is the middle child, so that often feels squeezed out, uh, feels that life is unfair and that they have been cheated. Some can become the problem child, while other middle children may actually become the peacemaker, who holds the family together. Uh, in a family of four siblings, the second child may feel like the middle child. Okay, so uh, are you the middle child? Do you identify with some of this? The youngest child, baby of the family and tends to be the most pampered, may develop helplessness and figure out how to get other people to do his or her or their work. Tends to go on their own way and then may outshine everyone else because of it. So were you the youngest child? Now, are you the only child? Shares high achievement with an older child. So remember that list of uh, descriptions for the older child? It's saying that the only child shares very similar, uh, similar experiences there, but may not learn how to share or cooperate with other children, knows how to deal with adults really well, pampered by parents and may become dependently tied to them, uh, one of them or both of them may want to uh, be center stage at all times, and may feel like others are trying to take his or her or their place, okay? Uh, so one of the things I wanted to point out for this one is knows how to deal with adults well. And that's probably because they don't have any other siblings to talk to. So more often than the other, uh, and the, you know, than, than the other ones, um, they'll probably have to talk to adults all the time, which is why they might know how to deal with adults uh, much more than the other ones. So before we finish this section right here, I also want to mention that Adler also, during Freudian time, so that's a really long time ago, so there were not as many divorces back then. There were not a lot of, as many, I believe, blended families. Blended families is, let's say, uh, parents who are divorced, right? And then they marry other people who also have children already. So you, as one parent, might have two kids or three kids, and then the person that you marry might have two or three kids as well. So now it's a family that's blended together. And those are things that will change how these uh, relationships are, right? So remember, you know, this is kind of good to understand if you're trying to uh, understand your client to talk about their experiences. But also you have to remember that this was created at a time 
uh, where the things that are happening in today's world did not happen back then, right? And then also, if you think about uh, biracial families, those things also might be very different as well because culturally things might be different as well. Okay. All right, let's talk about the therapeutic goals when it comes to Adlerian therapy. The collaborative arrangements between the client and the therapist, so you're working together. Mutual respect appears or is expected. Holistic psychological investigation of lifestyle assessment, so we're gonna understand who you are, you know, within your own self and how you work and exist within the, the society, the world, and then how that affects how you choose to live, your lifestyle assessment. All right, disclosing mistaken, per, uh, mistaken goals and faulty assumptions with this person's style of living. So maybe the way that they were raised, there were maybe some things that were not so healthy for them or incorrect or something like that. Let's say abuse or something like that, or, you know, a lot of yelling and screaming and, and being mean to each other. So if that happens, we might want to bring those things up and talk about potentially uh, adjusting those lifestyle assess uh, lifestyle behaviors, basically. So re-education of the client towards the useful side of life. The main aim here then is to develop the child's sense of belonging and to adopt behaviors of community feeling and then social interests as well. So if you do not know about the world, and maybe you don't because you were trying to just survive, you know, because it was a kind of a, uh, let's say, terrible childhood or a difficult childhood, but we start to learn as we grow older what we can do to help each other as well as ourselves. Do not view clients as sick or needing cures. Instead, re-educating people to reshape their societies. So, um, you know, uh, there are some things that, you know, you did that were, let's say, not the best choices when it comes to coping skills or survival. So we want to have you learn how to uh, see which what is a, what are better, healthier choices for you, let's say, right? And then from there, then, we can also help shape society into a healthier one as well. You want to provide information, teaching, guiding, and offering encouragement. So you're very much like a cheerleader to discourage uh, to these, these clients who feel very discouraged, right? They're feeling not so great, so you want to become a cheerleader for those people. Encouragement is considered the most powerful method for change. So encouragement is, you know, we believe that you can do it and you hopefully authentically believe that they can actually do it as well because that will help build self-confidence and courage for your clients. Courage is defined as willingness to act even when fearful. So one of the things I also want to say is that when you have clients coming in, usually clients are really scared, okay? It is really scared to be vulnerable, and it's also very scared to be to change, basically, because you don't know what's going to happen, potentially. So to let them know that you recognize that you see courage in them will be hopefully very, very, you know, uh, uh, fantastic for them and encouraging of them, right? Without fear, there can be no courage. And so, you know, when you are afraid of going to therapy, when you're afraid of changing, when you're afraid to ad address the stuff that's happened in your past that's not so great, uh, we want to make sure that we recognize that they have courage. Atlarians provide alternative perspectives, but it is up to the client to accept them. Okay, so you're going to offer all these different ways of seeing the world and hopefully your clients will then go from there right and go okay i get this i didn't realize it that this existed before but you know now i see it and then you're hoping that they're actually going to then start to go towards that right all right so you're going to help foster social interest helping clients overcome feelings of discouragement and inferiority Modifying clients' views and goals, so changing their lifestyle to a healthier one, hopefully. Changing faulty motivation, so if there were things that they thought were good but really were not good for them, now they're going to change those faulty ideas. Encouraging the uh, individual to recognize equality among the people, and then helping people to become contributing members of society. All right, now let's talk about the therapist's function and role. Believes that the client can become discouraged and function ineffectively due to mistaken beliefs, faulty values, and useless or self-absorbed goals. So we talked a little bit about these things before, right? These unhealthy ways of living, and hopefully now they're going to recognize those things. The therapist will look out for when the client feels very mistrust or you know distrust, selfishness, uh, unrealistic ambitions, and then of course a lack of confidence. Does not label the client with pathological diagnoses. Obviously, um, 
if you are someone who is getting paid, you probably will have to deal with insurance. And insurance, you might need to put these diagnoses on there, but within the actual therapeutic relationship, you don't necessarily have to really talk about those diagnoses. So you want to gather the information called the family constellation, which are your parents, the siblings, other livings, and uh, other people living in the home, your life tasks, your early recollections. All those things make up who you are as a person, right? So we want to understand all those things that exist in this family constellation. This is, uh, builds a person's early childhood world because this is how they see the world is because of all these people that have affected them when they were younger. One of the key terms that we talk about is early recollections, and it's actually a technique that's being used as well. So stories of events that a person says occurred before he, she, or they were 10 years of age. Specific incidents that clients recall, along with the feelings and thoughts that accompany these incidents. So these are really old memories, right? So if I told you right now, you know, just take a moment for a second, and I ask you, tell me the earliest memory that pops up in your head right? What are they? Summarize and interpret it, identify some of the areas of success potentially, and shows that clients do know how to think in a healthy way. Hopefully it's a happy thought. All right, lifestyle assessment. So this is about trying to understand how you live and see the world. So you're going to, it's a process of gathering early memories, learning, and then uh, understanding the goals and motivations of that client. Adler saw dreams as a rehearsal for possible future actions. So dream analysis that we were talking about before still exists amongst the Adlerians as well. Okay, now let's talk about the client's experience in therapy. There's a term called private logic, which are concepts about who you are as a self, a person, others, and then life that constitutes the philosophy on which a person's lifestyle is based. So what that is basically saying is we want to learn about your family and your childhood to see how that has influenced how you see the world, okay? Private logic that is unhealthy, in a way, interferes with social interests and does not show proper sense of belonging. So it requires a social living, uh, requirements of social living that are missing in that component because let's say you're struggling with certain things in life, right? So we wanna make sure that your private logic is healthy so that you know it goes along with what we've been talking about in Adler in this Adler chapter anyways. All right, uh, learning how to correct faulty assumptions and conclusions is central to Adlerian therapy. Here's an example. A chronically uh, depressed middle-aged man, so chronically basically means long-term. His lifestyle assessment is he has uh, convinced himself that nobody could really care about him. He rejects people before they have a chance to reject him. He is harshly critical of himself, expecting perfection. He has expectations that things will go, will rarely go, or will rarely work out very well for him. He burdens himself with guilt because he is convinced he is letting everyone down. So can you identify with some of this? And does this actually hinder your life as well? So in this example, I think uh, many people have felt these ways, right? So, um, a lot of these things are developed from their childhood and still cling to them as a way to see the world, right? Because that's how what you know. Um, so that's how you see the world. Pessimistic and looking for validation. And then depression will help him avoid contact with other people, right? So if you're really bummed out about life, then yeah, you're not going to try so that you don't get disappointed. So you're protecting yourself. All right, depression is an excuse for someone to retreat from life. Feeling as being aligned with thinking and as fuel for behaving. First we think, then we feel, and then we act, right? So how we see the world makes us feel a specific way, and then that's how we act, right? The therapist will offer encouragement so that change is possible for this specific person. Relationship between the therapist and the client. It's going to be based on cooperation between you two, mutual trust, respect, confidence, collaboration, and of course, making sure that you both agree on those goals. Okay, the counselor's modeling of communication and acting in good faith. So one of the first things as a counselor is that you need to realize that your client is looking at you to see how you behave, right? How you talk, because they might want to uh, see, see that as, you know, a, a healthy way to do it, right? And so you want to make sure that you're aware of that. 
contract should be signed at the beginning. So the contract is basically, you know, the informed consent and also let's say deciding what you want to work on in therapy. You want to do all that, establish all that at the beginning. So, uh, and then in the contract, you can talk about what they want, how they plan to get where they are heading. So exactly what are they going to do to get to these goals that they have? What is preventing them from successfully attaining their goals? How can they change non-productive behavior into constructive behavior? And how they can make a full sense or full use of their assets in achieving their purposes. So now that they're learning all these things, how are they going to apply it? And then in the future, if it happens again in another way or something very similar, how are they going to react? How are they going to solve these problems? Let's say after uh, the relationship with you in counseling is over. All right, let's talk about the applications now, the therapeutic techniques and procedures. And we've heard a couple of them before, but we're going to really go into it now. All right, there are four central objectives. Okay, so four central goals that you want to do when it comes to Adlerian therapy. Number one, establish a proper therapeutic relationship. So that means make sure that you two know what your roles are and the relationship is good, healthy, authentic, and genuine. All right, two, explore the psychological dynamics operating in the client. So that lifestyle assessment, you want to understand their family constellation, what's going on there. Three, encourage the development of self-understanding. So now they need to, now that they've explored, let's say, who they have been, right? They need to also understand what they have been doing that might be very unhealthy for them as of now, which is the reason why they're coming to therapy, right? So it's insight into the purpose of therapy. Four is to help the client make new choices. So uh, now that you're offering them suggestions together, you're working and discovering these new ways of behaving or thinking or whatever it is, we want to reorient them and then re-educate them so that now they're going to choose a healthier way to behave. All right, Adlerian Brief Therapy, ABT. So um, the book for some of the theories, there are brief versions, which are like the shorter version. Instead of, let's say, a whole year's worth of therapy, it might be more like two months worth of therapy instead. So the phase one of Adlerian Brief Therapy is establish a relationship, like we said before. Progress is possible when there is an alignment of clearly defined goals between therapist and client. Must deal with the personal issues the client sees as significant and is willing to explore and change. So like we said before, uh, this is kind of like repeating a little bit of the before, right? Because this is such an essential component when it comes to therapy and Adlerian therapy. Help clients recognize their strengths and their assets. So once they realize what's going on is to then, you know, let them know that they do have this in them to achieve these goals that they have. Phase two is to explore the individual's psychological dynamics. Get a deeper understanding of an individual's lifestyle. Focus on the person's social and cultural context. So really understand where they're coming from ethnically, multiculturally as well. That's another component that's really important. And then we have also the subjective interview, which is the counselor helps the client to tell his or her or their life story as completely as possible. Okay, so empathetic listening and responding, which basically means is that you honestly are paying attention to your client. You're not thinking about how to respond to your uh, your client or anything. You're sitting there to, and actively listening to them, right? And then when they ask a question or they're having a conversation with you, to pay attention and then know how to react, right? And how to respond to them. Let them do most of the talking. Okay, then the next is must come from a sense of wonder, fascination, and interest. I hope that you are very interested in your client. Right. Um, and because everyone is so unique. So you want to see how they function, how they think, how they operate and then see, you know, how they're getting better. Right. That's the reason why they're coming to therapy. Treat the client as experts in their own lives, which is, again, also something that we will emphasize throughout this entire class. Each of your clients knows themselves the best. You do not know them as well as they know themselves. Right. They might not necessarily be willing to address or, you know, and say that but they really do know who they are as people. And so you have to respect that and then also um, uh, let them lead the way when it comes to talking about who they are as a person. The objective interview discovers information about how the problems in the client's life began. This is more of like, you know, what is what is seen and, and you know, not necessarily arguable because this is legitimately what happened. This is very objective, right? Things that you can see and you can't really argue with. Let's say if there was abuse in the family and we all know it, then that's, you know, that you can't say, oh, well, that's personal. You might not be abused. No, you were probably abused if that's what people have recorded or, you know, this is what has been seen. All right. Any precipitating events. So you want to know about 
anything that might be happening around that person that might have caused certain things to go a certain way. Their medical history, current, and then also their past medication. Their social history, reasons uh, the client chose therapy at this time. Person coping with life tasks and lifestyle assessment. So this is also kind of known as like an intake, right? Uh, background history of the client so that they can understand who they are as a person. And of course, investigate the family constellation and early childhood history that we have been talking about before. It is interpretations people develop about themselves, others in the world, and life that governs what they do. So this is, again, repeating what we said before, which is how you were raised up until today, how you have seen the world, uh, was because of how you were raised and the community that you were in. So we want to make sure that we understand what's going on. We want to focus on the holistic narrative, which makes sense of a way that the person copes with life tasks, and to uncover the private logic involved in coping. So we want to basically understand who they are as a person so that we know how or why they're reacting the way that they are reacting, because maybe that's the only way that they know how to react to stressors, right, is to ignore things or to avoid things or whatever it is. Here's an example. Jenny has lived most of her life in a critical environment. Now she believes that she must be perfect to avoid even the appearance of failure. So maybe something like this is her parents might have been very picky about you know, how to be successful, and maybe she was having a hard time. And so because of that, she doesn't even want to try because if she tries to, she fails, she feels really bad about herself. You know how other family members might encourage a child who fails to try again, and then maybe they'll succeed? Sometimes it gets too out of control, or, or the child believes it's too stressful, and then now they're going to just avoid it all so that, you know, instead of, you know, disappointing and feeling really bad about themselves as a failure, uh, they're not even going to try, and then, you know, that's it. Therapy will focus on this restricted living that comes from this perspective. So if we, let's say, client, the Jenny is our client, we would now know how to focus on what to talk about and where to uh, go from there when it comes to therapy. All right, this is the end of part two.